So if you're here, it's because probably you're interested in climate litigation, legal campaigns, and especially how to be more involved in this. Uh, what actually us as young people can do uh, to, to actually join the forces uh, of those people already in case. So this will also be tackled today uh, through different uh, presentations from, uh, uh, from uh, our panelists. Um, so uh, we are here also um, to, to introduce a new initiative that uh, we have um, launched together with organizations such as Aurora Malet, World Youth for Climate Justice, and, uh, and, and many others. That is, we have set up a youth uh, climate law hub, uh, the aim of which is to actually connect different people engaged, already engaged with the climate litigation, um, to actually support each other, uh, join forces, and uh, show support also in terms of advocacy on legal matters and on, on social media um, action. Uh, we have set this up uh, basically last semester, but we are now opening, opening it to also whoever is interested in actually knowing more about climate litigation. Uh, so for those who are interested in uh, in this, we will have uh, some also bi-monthly calls in which we will also know more about uh, our members. So if you're interested, please um, send, uh, like you can write your email here in the chat and we'll, we'll make sure to reach out to um, you. So today, today we will have uh, some presentations from uh, uh, members of this Youth Climate Law Hub. Um, first of all, we will start with Alex from YE. He will uh, give a brief presentation on national energy and climate plans. What are they? Why young people uh, shall uh, be involved in them? And why they are also connected with, uh, uh, with legal action? And potentially in the future, they can be uh, a great value for climate litigation as well. Um, secondly, we will have uh, Samira for, from World Youth for Climate Justice. So, yeah, the well-known international youth-led campaign that aims to bring climate change uh, to the ICJ. Uh, we will also discuss with Samira how we can all contribute to make this happen and to actually um, make this successful. Then we will have uh, Ida from Aurora Male. Uh, so uh, Aurora represents 300 young people who have sued the Swedish state for insufficient climate action. So we will discuss how and why they have chosen human rights-based climate litigation as a tool for climate justice and what they have learned um, that could make also the job of other youth-led organizations easier. We will finish uh, this workshop by a presentation from uh, Victorine Nagel. Uh, she is a young lawyer uh, involved actually in defending young climate activists in court. So discussion uh, will, uh, will be around why, which kind of legal action we can take as, uh, as young people, what are the risks involved. And also, um, is it different from uh, if uh, I take a legal action myself or if I do it on behalf of my organization? And uh, what are actually the, the lessons that we have learned from this? So um, with that said, uh, maybe we can start with the um, uh, with the first uh, uh, speaker. Before that, I would like uh, to, to say that you're completely free to send your questions in the chat and ask us questions at the end of each presentation. We will choose one, two questions at the end of each presentation, but also we will have the time to actually uh, answer all the questions at the end of all the presentations. So, um, yes, I will pass the floor to Alex and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, sorry, everyone, this was the quietest place I could find for the presentation today. I hope that you can all hear me well. And yeah, thank you all so much for being here. And I'm very excited to be one of the presenters today. And I think like what we're going to hear is, is basically for really, really, really big things that young people are involved in, in a time where we are very uncertain about how we can move on to work on the climate crisis, and especially uh, when it comes to litigation. So I'm going to share my screen to give a presentation about NECPs, which is something that 
if you have been following the work of YE, we have been talking quite a lot about. So can you all see my screen? Mm, yes, we can, but if you can share. Oh my God, yeah. Now? Perfect, okay, so. amazing. Sorry about that. So, okay. So also another point is this will be the least maybe um, litigation related topic of today. It is an introduction into possibilities of litigation in an area that is really upcoming. And yeah, that we have taken as one of the main tasks of Legal Seed Stream, our environmental law project in YEE with Emma, Ronya and Remina, who are all in this call. So basically to begin with, um, we have NECPs. Um, I'm thinking then many people probably in this call might not even be familiar with this concept. Um, but who would like to give a brief um, explanation of what NECPs are, what they know? Uh, you can just unmute your mic and shout it. Please, someone break the silence. <laughs> okay, I will assume nobody knows, so this should make the presentation even more interesting. So, NECPs basically stand for National Energy and Climate Plans. Um, they're legal basis is the 2018 governance regulation and EU regulation and as the name says and um, they basically consist plans which reflect how the EU member states are going to meet their energy and climate targets and I'm including here a very interesting quote from Can Europe which shows why they are particularly important and this is because without a plan and measures the climate targets would just be empty promises so Basically, the NCPs have to reflect how the EU member states are going to meet anything that has to do with energy and climate related targets until 2030. Um, mainly, when we talk about this, uh, we want to achieve the goal of Fit for 55, which is a 40 and 55% emissions reduction compared to 1990 levels. So, going to the next slide, when we say uh, integration of plans that have to do with energy and climate, we mean all of these. So some are more technical for people with a legal background to know, but we have from the Renewable Energy Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive to the Effort Sharing Regulation and all of these that you see on the slide. So the EU has come up with so many different legislation and policy and that reflects climate and energy targets. And the NECP is where all these can be combined in order to reflect whether the EU member states are up to actually achieving this target by 2030 with the policies that they are currently planning. So basically, it is very, very, very important that in these national energy and climate plans, uh, the state also needs to take into consideration the views of the public. This is ingrained in the governance regulation in Article 10, where it is basically said that member states need to give the public early and effective opportunities to participate in the creation of the NECPs. This can be done in a form of consultation, and many states have done the most basic form of a consultation in which they upload a document and they say, hello, this is our national energy and climate plan. Please give us your feedback. And there is a 300 page document. Sometimes uh, it is not even available in one of the primary languages of the country. For example, in my country, Cyprus, we only had um, the NECP in English uh, so far. And now it is for the first time available in Greek. So there have been quite a few barriers. But the main point here is that there is this explicit public participation provision. And this is also in line with the Argus Convention requirements that such plans need to undergo a public participation. So moving on, um, you would say now, okay, and um, many times there can be this opportunity to participate, but how do I know that my opinion has been taken into consideration? And the answer is, yeah, in practice, um, we have also been conducting interviews with people who have participated and the vast majority is saying, I don't think my comments were taken into consideration. 
Nevertheless, the governance regulation has included in the law that the member state needs to also upload a description of the public consultation that took place, what involvement also happened, and what the results were. So this is something that we have ingrained in law and that we can basically push for. At the same time, the European Commission in December 2023 issued an assessment of what NECPs they had received so far. And they said, it is crucial to run timely and well-organized public consultations to ensure that they are inclusive and to build acceptance for subsequent action. Um, and yeah, this is basically the, the basic reason why we want public participation, uh, inclusivity and acceptance. Uh, if you have the opportunity to share your views and you feel like your views have been taken into consideration, then you will be more willing to accept the plan. Especially imagine when it is a plan that can make many people unhappy, ranging from agriculture uh, to the businesses, to the industry, to people who simply do not want to change their lifestyle in front of the climate crisis. So to continue, um, in YEE, it is one of our main goals to inspire young people to participate in any way they can in um, the public participation pathways that are open in these energy and climate plans. So a quick presentation of what uh, we have been doing. So far, we have released a handbook that basically explains the essential of what NECPs are and how you can participate. If you have not seen it yet, I would strongly advise you um, to see it, you can find it on our website and we can also send it on a comment um, on this call. Then uh, we are basically conducting interviews with young people, asking them, how easy did you find it to participate? What barriers did you find? How do you think these barriers can be overcome? And we have been focusing on five countries and we want to issue national reports to explain how youth participation has gone so far and to basically give a message to the government that has the obligation to take into consideration the views of the public, show how exactly um, it treated the views of the public and, and influence it therefore this way. Hopefully that they would take it into consideration that way. And the last part of our campaign would be that we would basically want to issue an EU-wide policy paper, policy position paper, sorry, that would depend on these interviews that we do and that hopefully it would reflect a better governance from the side of member states and that would be really important for them to take the views of young people and basically, yeah, seriously in a matter that is really, really important. So you can hear that and you can think, okay, this is overwhelming. This is a major plan. I will not understand. I do not have a technical background, but there are so many ways in which you can basically be involved simply by being informed you can basically see, for example, a short infographic on the performance of your member states, if you're from the EU and NECP so far, and with very clear guidelines, for example, participation was not good enough because, for example, the draft NECP was available too late with such concrete examples. And if you're interested, you can then be involved in advocacy as basically we are trying to um, advocate by the release of the position papers and um, that they should be taken more seriously. There should be participation methods that are not simply uploading a 300 page document, but much more deliberate in order to approach the youth and actively take into consideration what the youth has to say. And in this, uh, there are civil society organizations that can be very helpful for you. So basically any NGO in your country that you would know that they are interested in this matter, um, and at the same time, the ultimate goal would be to participate yourselves um, in the ways that hopefully would be more accessible, but the minimum would be actually targeting the part of, let's say, worst case scenario, a 300 page document that you understand something about and that you would like to leave your comment on and have your say. So going to the next slide, um, this is a, a snippet of what the handbook is. Here are the faces of the legal seeds team. And, and yeah, I would really, really advise you uh, to give it a look. And basically to highlight that you don't need to be an expert to participate. And I'm highlighting again, all these relevant areas of EU law that will be reflected in the NACP. And think about, is there anything out of this that I would know um, more about? And 
I want to give an example also in the case of Greece, and um, it was basically found that just transition is not reflected adequately at all in the National Energy and Climate Plan. But there is an NGO in Greece in an area that is undergoing just transition that did not even know about the existence of this plan and has done so much research on it. So for example, communicating with them and letting them know that this is an important plan which could reflect the just transition plans that affect them directly. This is a case in which it would be very important for them to participate. And of course, it ranges from being an important stakeholder to this to, for example, for your understanding, oh, um, I don't think that this mode of renewable energy is one that I would like my country to be focusing on because of this and this reason. Or, oh, uh, they haven't taken into consideration this um, area that should be protected for this biodiversity in this plan. Or, I don't think this is a way which would really address energy poverty in this country because of this and this. And you can also, of course, email us, the Legal Seeds team, if you would like some inspiration about comments uh, that you could basically write and areas that you could target. Then moving on, the interesting part and novelty of today's presentation on NECPs is that I would like to talk to you about the litigation opportunities that are in place. So, um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. So to find um, to find more about litigation opportunities, basically the Climate Litigation Network has done an incredible research um, on what litigation opportunities could come up. Since there are quite a few obligations around how NECPs should look, how the public should participate in NECPs, what member states should do, and um, then there are also litigation opportunities for when this does not occur, as has been stated. So starting from lighter measures such as we have the EU Commission complaints uh, or we could have an Arhus Convention Compliance Committee communication which would basically entail um, yeah, like Seneca complained about how your uh, how the country's um, policy has been so far inadequate and um, say for example hey public participation really did not meet the criteria there was no document explaining how anyone's views were taken into consideration and uh, there was never a dialogue set up for civil society to express the views all all this could basically constitute the basis for uh, starting litigation legal letters then fall under the, the same category they could work as a warning against uh, if a state for example has not been following um, the governance regulation requirements so far it can act as a warning especially now as yeah something very important to mention that I have not so far is that the next uh, round of NECPs, they need to be published by June 2024. So now countries have gotten their feedback from the European Commission and countries also need to open the NECPs once more to feedback. And they have until June 2024 to submit a version that would hopefully um, adequately reflect the targets of each country so to reach the emissions reduction that we want by 2030 and at the same time hopefully adopt um, more effective public participation procedures that are open and accessible to the youth uh, and then we go to the more interesting part which could be administrative challenges so you can basically go to an administrative court it could also be judicial and explain and like these provisions of the NECP did not take place as they should, whether it comes to um, there was never a document uploaded in the public consultation or um, the NECP does not address at all the just transition in my country or the placing of renewables. And in the end, something that will be very interesting and is connected to also more that we will hear in today's presentations, human rights claims for insufficient ambition, as we have seen. Dangerous climate change is recognized uh, by more and more courts as basically uh, a reason that foreseeable harm could take place and insufficient ambition to this would then constitute a human rights violation. So this is um, what uh, yeah, we have decided to show you today regarding the litigation options that will be. Uh, but as I said, the report from the Climate Litigation Network is also really, really interesting for any one of you who is interested in what litigation there can be regarding NECPs. And keep your eyes open because the goal is that there will be litigation and there will be civil society involved in delivering these. So that would be a really, really, really great opportunity to be involved in such things by reaching out to civil society in your country that you know could be involved.
So yeah, I'd like to say thank you very much. Once again, the basis of our amazing Legal Seeds 3 theme. And I think, am I right? We open the floor for questions. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, if any of you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand and, uh, uh, or write in the chat. We will be able to actually answer one or two questions now. Um, and the rest, we, we make sure to answer later. You can, yeah, in the meantime, um, Okay, so I think uh, for now there are no questions. Yeah, feel free actually to drop uh, the questions uh, whenever you want, okay? And uh, thank you so much again, Alex, uh, for your presentation. So we we actually tackled uh, a bit the European Union sphere now with this uh, climate litigation opportunities. Um, now we are moving both to the global sphere. So I will pass the floor to Samira from World of Climate Justice, who actually will um, give us an insight on what are the state, which what is the state of affairs of actually the campaign for the for the from the ICJ on climate change and what actually we can do to join forces with them. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ingmar, for organizing this amazing uh, webinar workshop. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen right now, and hopefully it will appear. OK. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So, Perfect. Uh, then I'll go on a sort of presentation on this advisory opinion uh, that we have started uh, to the International Court of Justice that is mostly focused on climate change and human rights. Um, so I will try to focus on a few points. I'll make sure to not make it too long and not lose you on the way. But basically what we're going to try to do is uh, understand what is an advisory opinion and uh, the potential of it. We'll also try to understand what uh, is the court that we're going to work with and how we got there exactly and who we had to work with to be able to do that. And, and as the last point, we'll try to see what our next step for us. So, but before that, we have to get down to the root of it, how this is all started. Um, so this started with 27 law students, like many of us, I guess, uh, in this uh, call that were seeing that um, climate change was really affected their uh, countries. Uh, they were students from the Pacific uh, region. So they're also wondering what they could do to try to make, uh, sh make changes of the situation. So they tried to turn into law and see what had happened before or what tool they could use to make those changes happen and make sure that uh, their countries are not too affected by uh, the uh, impact of climate change. And so what they saw is that there was an initiative that was started in 2011 uh, by Palau and Marshall Islands, and that was actually an advisory opinion on climate change. Uh, but that initiative had failed. It was not able to go on uh, because the court had decided that uh, the what the Palau state had brought to them as an advisory opinion was not um, was not a legal question. So take, building upon that, those students decided to uh, also try to have an advisory opinion on climate change, but this time they brought the element of human rights. Um, and they decided to uh, to broaden also the movement and not to only put it from the Pacific perspective, but also from the uh, global perspective, because this is something that's going to affect us all. And that way they were able to join forces with people around the world and bring this forth in front of the International Court of Justice. Uh, before I continue, I think that it's important for me to come back on a few things. So the International Court of Justice is the um, uh, is the uh, body of uh, the United Nations that is uh, mostly focusing on legal matters. It has two ways of proceeding of making those legal matters is either by the 
you're uh, deliberating between state conflicts, uh, or it can also do advisory uh, advisory procedure. Um, but uh, first, you have to understand what is an advisory opinion. So basically, an advisory opinion is a um, legal question that is going to be asked to a court or an international tribunal on a matter of law that we consider that we do not have the answer to and that we need a body of expert of judges to answer those questions too. Uh, and this serves to advance international uh, and it serves to advance law in general itself to uh, help us better understand how to work around issues. And it is particularly important in uh, with the ICG because the ICG uh, is the what we call the highest court in the world. So it has served to uh, really help us um, create international law. It has served us to really push the boundaries of what we understand. So having this at the International Court of Justice is really um, a big momentum. And this could be, uh, this advisory opinion that we have started could be particularly important because as we said, it works on human rights and climate change. It will be able to really um, make sure that people recognize what are the exact extents of uh, the connection between human rights and climate change. Because even if like states and UN bodies in general can recognize the fact that um, climate change is gonna affect our human rights, there is like no exact understanding on what are the state's obligations when it comes to um, those effects actually. So this advisory opinion will be able to really clarify that it will provide also guidance uh, at all court level. It will help us also, uh, even if it's not already now the case, but it will also help us cement the scientific evidence of climate change. It will also help us be more uh, ambitious in terms of the um, Paris Agreement, and it will also encourage uh, cooperation and mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. Um, so um, now we'll try to understand how we got there exactly because this was not an easy fit. Um, so how we started is we, to be able to go to the International Court of Justice, we have uh, to first convince the state to help us ask the question uh, to the UN because uh, people are not able to just go to the International Court of Justice um, and ask those kind of questions. Uh, only states are competent to do to be able to do that. Um, so we're able to come to uh, have the state of Vanuatu uh, lead uh, this uh, initiative, and it was able also to convince sixteen other states uh, to join a close group of uh, a core group of states that was able to create questions um, around the resolution that is called resolution. Uh, 77,276. <laughs> um, so those two questions were, uh, first, they try to ask what are the legal obligations of states when it comes to climate change, uh, to when it comes to the impact of climate change to the, uh, um, to the human system. And also the second question that they ask is when it comes to those, uh, um, what are also the legal consequences of those obligations, in particular when it comes to small and developing states and also when it comes to future generations. Um, and uh, that resolution was voted in March last year on the 29th of March. Uh, and um, it was uh, voted by consensus, which is quite uh, staple. And it also shows how much this, uh, this is historic and how much uh, this is important for all states in the world, and it also will encourage the uh, ICG to take this seriously and uh, really make an advisory opinion that will be um, um, really progressive, which is what we want, uh, because we want to make sure that uh, the ad this advisory opinion makes sure to clarify some of the questions that we ask ourselves also as young people, like um, we want to make sure that, for example, it. Um, make a clear definition of what international equity is and uh, how states have obligations in terms also of that principle. 
Um, and now I'm going to try to move on and explain what is coming next now that we have the resolution. We call uh, two phases. Uh, the first phase is a written phase, and that phase in itself is divided into phases actually. So in the written phase, um, we state are gonna answer the question that has been asked to the ICG, uh, and they're gonna take those questions and uh, answer them. They're all invited to answer them, and they have a deadline, which is the 22nd of March of this year to answer those questions. And after that, the ICG will receive all of that and it will give state two additional months to uh, be able to comment on the, um, on the answer that they receive to the questions. Uh, and after those two additional months of uh, commenting, then the written phase will be over and we'll go into what we call a neural phase where the state will be able to come and uh, make statements when it comes to um, what they what they what they have written so far, and they will be able to plead before the court, uh, and this is also a really important step for us uh, to be able to to be able to influence states in those two phases. For example, as of right now, we're trying to reach out to write to state and tell them to participate if they are not going to do it already to participate in those advisory proceedings, but also to make sure to. Uh, include argument from youth. And we have written this lovely, <laughs> lovely thing here. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but uh, this is basically a handbook that we have written that explain what uh, is this whole proceeding in details and also what are the arguments that we think are going to be really important to see in the advisory opinion. Um, and uh, after that, when we will have the finished that uh, written phase, on the oral phase, what we we'll also try to do is influence against states and also the ICG to take uh, into account that this whole uh, initiative was started by civil society, by young people, and we'll try to go before the court and make uh, you know, activities around them and tell the court that we're watching them and tell the state that we're all also watching them. So this is like a really important initiative in that way. And um, if you want to help, you're all invited to write to your own state, if it's possible, to write also maybe to your UN focal point. You can find the email address on the internet really easily for the UN focal point. And uh, you can also reach out to me and we can discuss different way of helping if you want. So this is all from me. And I will stop the recording now. If you have like any question, please do not hesitate to ask them. Thank you so much, Samira. It was very inspiring. And uh, I will just restate what you just said. Uh, it's just like uh, what we I understood from this is like we shall definitely reach out uh, to as many um, contact points from our states as possible and also to the UN focal point. And uh, as you said, um, the email addresses are already are public in the, in, in the website. So, if you feel like you want to, to join forces, uh, that's the, the first step uh, until the 27th of March. Um, thank you so much, Samira. If you have any questions, please raise your hand or write them in the chat as in the video. I will now uh, pass the floor to a national case. Um, so the case brought by uh, our Roman organization uh, against the Swedish state. And for this, I will uh, pass the floor to Ida for uh, more insights. Thank you so much, Emma, for uh, organizing this and for um, inviting me to speak. And thank you, everyone who are here today. Can you see my screen? Amazing. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, Aurora, which Emma already mentioned is an initiative that has sued the Swedish state for insufficient climate action. And the case was brought by an organization called Aurora, which is a youth led association suing the Swedish state for insufficient climate measures. And um, our case is about 300 young people living in Sweden who sued the Swedish state for, I'm saying it again, insufficient climate measures. 
uh, in a class action lawsuit in November 2022. And so far, the case has gotten to a point where we might um, elevate a certain question of the case to the Supreme Court. So that is where we're at right now. But we have two goals with this uh, lawsuit. The first one is to win in court, obviously, uh, and get the state to do uh, take sufficient climate action. The second goal we have is to use the platform of the case to raise awareness about the urgent need for action in the climate crisis and to mobilize for, for that action. Um, and the reason that we find this goal so important is that, is that we have found that a litigation case like this forms a very compelling narrative in the media. So it's a very um, inspiring or um, useful story uh, to being a group of young people taking on a very important, powerful actor that is uh, wrecking our future. So there's, it, it's a powerful David and Goliath narrative, and we are determined to make the best of use of that. And so because of these two goals, we do more than just uh, litigate. We do media, social media, fundraising, advocacy, collaborations, lectures, um, climate crisis, awareness raising, and mobilization for transformation. Simply. And so I just wanted to start with, with talking a bit about where we come from. And you all know this because we all come from here, uh, the midst of a climate emergency. And, and I've chosen this quote from the IPCC uh, because I think that it highlights uh, some of the key issues um, that we that have caused us our action. Uh, so I think that this probably highlights the urgency of the situation, the absolute urgent needs for immediate action. And I think that it also highlights how the climate emergency is an issue of life, life and health for many and maybe for all. I also think that it highlights the uh, very important aspect of intergenerational equity that Samira mentioned. Um, and this means that um, if drastic action is not taken, the climate crisis will get worse for us who are young today. Um, and this is if drastic measures aren't taken and if our entire economic system isn't transformed. And so the loss of life, health and life that is already happening to people, ecosystems, animals and plants in the areas that are most affected by the climate crisis, these effects will reach even privileged Sweden. Um, and Sweden is a country that has been relatively protected from the effects, despite the fact that we carry a large part of the blame for having caused the climate crisis through emitting greenhouse gases in our industrialization. So there's an extreme unfairness to the situation even within the, this generation. And so finally, um, it is clear based on this science that government's inaction in the climate emergency is threatening young people's human rights, our rights to life and to health and to home and to well-being. So in this dire situation, there's an urgent need for um, legitimate and effective tools for climate justice. There's an urgent need for transformation. And we have decided to use law as a tool for such transformation. And the reason for this are mainly two. We, um, we find law to be a legitimate Tool because litigating like this is using the system of democratic rule of law, of access to justice, and of human rights. And through using these uh, institutions, we also strengthen them uh, because they, their place in our democratic systems become um, clearer and stronger. And uh, human rights obligations are also fairly strong in many European jurisdictions. Uh, and so this makes human rights a particularly potent legal tool. And that brings me to the effectiveness point because we have based our use of law on the notion that law is sort of unignorable. And by this, we mean that everyone needs to have some sort of relationship to the law. You can break the law, but then if you do, that has consequences. And the idea with bringing a climate case like this is that we're bringing those consequences. If the state violates um, its duty to protect our human rights from the dangers of the climate crisis, then that will have consequences. They will get sued in court. And um, the climate litigation tool is also effective because it has potentially large consequences for um, climate policy obligations. Because if um, a case like Aurora wins, then we can have a binding verdict calling for drastic upscaling of Swedish climate policy. And so there's a very concrete and substantial potential end result to these cases. 
And there are many international bodies that have recognized this potential power of the climate litigation movement, such as the UNEP and also the IPCC has said something similar. Um, and we are not the only ones, obviously, who have thought about using this tool for climate justice. Many have done it before us. Um, the climate litigation is the climate litigation movement is global. There have been over 2,000 climate cases brought across the world on all continents except the Antarctica, which is my favorite joke ever. Um, <laughs> Uh, so internationally, as Samira already talked about, there is there are ongoing proceedings or initiatives um, by, at the International Court of Justice. There are also uh, initiatives at the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea and also at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And in Europe, there are many ongoing initiatives as well. Um, we have seen successes in climate cases brought, to, uh, climate cases claiming that uh, government inaction on climate change is threatening people's human rights, and such cases have been successful in the Netherlands, and Germany, and France, and other countries. And there are also three um, important cases ongoing in the European Court of Human Rights. I say three, but there are many, and all of them are important. <laughs> Don't take it back. Um, but there are three in the Grand Chamber, and uh, this means that they have uh, the European Court of Human Rights have placed a uh, special importance on these cases. And something that um, both the Grand Chamber cases, the Netherlands, Germany and France cases, and Aurora have in common is that we are so-called systemic mitigation cases based on the European Convention on Human Rights. And this means that we are cases attacking the entirety of a state's mitigation, climate the emissions mitigation policy, um, saying that it threatens our human rights because it is insufficient. So um, I'm, oh, I should also say that uh, while this move, in this movement, all new cases build upon earlier cases and are greatly helped by their strategies and precedents. And all new cases also bring something new to the movement. And so something that Aurora bring is a focus on ecosystems and conservation. And we are also part of highlighting the youth perspective that we are talking here today, uh, together with many other cases like the SJ case you just heard about. And so what we in Aurora want, uh, the entire point of winning in court for us would be that the Swedish state do its fair share of the global climate measures necessary to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And um, the notion that all states should do this comes from both science, because science is very clear that um, if all countries do not do their fair share, then 1.5 will not be possible to keep with them. Um, and this, these notions of fairness and equity are also present in many international climate law. Um, and so <clears throat> we want the Swedish state to do its fair share. Um, and you can see here on the graph that uh, the Swedish fair share, as calculated using science and international law, is the yellow line um, compared to the green line, which is where Sweden is headed right now. So instead of doing their fair share, Swedish climate policy um, is flawed in many ways. Some ways is that the Swedish emissions reductions targets exclude large parts of emissions, they exclude protections of ecosystems, they lack ambition in line with fair share, and even though the targets are so insufficient, they are not even being reached. So it's easy to conclude that if Aurora would win our case, then that would demand drastic emissions reductions. Um, yeah, a binding verdict could mean that the Swedish state is obligated to do their fair share and very drastically reduce their emissions. And uh, the way that we try to make this happen is almost entirely through youth volunteers. And we are able to work this way because we live in a very privileged uh, economy where we have the opportunity to spend time on this. Um, but youth volunteers are responsible for all of the major work categories that we do um, towards all of our goals. And that includes legal strategy, legal writing and reading, fundraising, network building, media outreach, social media, education demonstrations, network building, and other environmental advocacy, and administration mobilization.
action and internal democracy and sustainable and healthy activism, which are also important internal aspects of this struggle. Um, and so uh, this uh, webinar is supposed to highlight ways in which interested young people can uh, join this movement, can um, become a part of the movement using law as a tool for climate justice. And so I have a guide, how to sue your government in three steps. And the first step that we have done, right? <laughs> Yay! Um, uh, the first step that we have found uh, very important is that you need to find each other. You need to be a team of uh, convinced and um, motivated people, young people, it works very well, um, who can um, bring their energy into uh, making an initiative like this. Uh, you get to the finish line. And so first of all, find each other. Um, and being part of a webinar like this is a great, great first step into finding each other, obviously. <laughs> um, the second step is to find knowledge because uh, bringing a case like this or any climate case requires hefty amounts of knowledge, both of law and of science and of how to bring campaigns. Um, and I just wanna highlight that there are so many brilliantly knowledgeable activists and scientists and lawyers and NGOs working with climate litigation and having the experience for bringing um, many successful and many unsuccessful but uh, learning um, cases we could learn from uh, in many different jurisdictions. So <clears throat> you do not have to reinvent the wheel. If you're interested in um, bringing a climate case, then there are many people you can reach out to, you can get in touch with who we have found will help you. Uh, people are very helpful and people want this tool to be used more. Uh, we definitely do in Aurora, so you can reach out to us. Um, <laughs> and there are many climate litigation networks such as this Youth Hub and also um, other ones working um, with more cases. For example, the climate litigation network that Alex already uh, mentioned. And you might want help with more things than just science and law and media. Maybe you want help with uh, fundraising or communications material or spreading your message or safety issues. And um, I just wanna say that it's available out there. People are helpful. Um, finally, you unfortunately have to find some cash. Um, and this <laughs> is because um, both because litigation can be a very risky and costly business depending on your jurisdiction. Uh, there are both fees and costs when you have to pay your lawyers and have to pay your way into court. Um, but there are also can also be substantial risks if you uh, get obligated to pay the litigation costs of your opponent if you lose, for example. So <laughs> it's possible that substantial amounts of capital will be required. So unfortunately, you have to find some rich people who can support you. Um, we in Aurora are mostly supported by crowdfunding, actually. So we haven't found some rich people. We've found lots of sort of rich people, uh, which is also possible, and which is another reason why it's so important to um, try to use the case as a platform to bring attention, to bring support from the public. Because we have also found that the public are sort of interested in um, using this tool, climate justice. And I think that has to do with the tool being so concrete and being having the potential of so very substantial and concrete uh, measures or like uh, effects. Um, and another aspect of having to find money is that you have to find time. We have done most of what we have done without getting paid because we have been able to, but apart from everyone are able to. So getting money is another way to uh, get time to be able to work on a case like this because it takes can take many years and can be very time intensive, as I'm sure many of us are aware. Um, yeah, so those were my three steps. Thank you so much for listening. And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or want to talk about anything. Thank you. Thank you also uh, to you, Ida. It was a very practical uh, presentation that uh, also gave some concrete uh, ideas on how actually to join. Um, mm -hmm. So I hope that, like, I will also, uh, I also learned a lot from this presentation. So thanks, uh, thanks again. Um, feel free to please cases. Uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat.
Um, we are going to run a bit late, but stay with us because we have a last presentation from actually the person who actually will uh, has some experience in defending actually climate activists. So uh, it will be super interesting to also hear from Victory, um, who is a lawyer and um, uh, will give some insights on actually what are the challenges uh, when young people turn to court and actually how to overcome these challenges and uh, some things as well. So the floor is your victory. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes, so um, due, due to confidentiality of my because of my work and because I'm at work at the moment, I'm, I will not be able and allowed to share my screen. But so you are only going to see me, but I'm going to be my I'm going to do my best to just talk about this topic. And it's really good that I'm just uh, following Ida intervention because I'm I'm just following your three steps. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. So. Um, just before the meeting, Emma sent us a, que a question from one of you. So when and in what context is climate litigation appropriate and when it's not? So that's a question for the lawyers. You know, we have to, before going to court with uh, climate activists, we have to um, search and to prevent climate activists to go to court if it's not um, a good idea for them. We all know in science, and we have heard it during the meeting today, that um, in science, we all agree that there, there is a climate crisis, obviously, and that young people are really involved. We also know that the climate crisis is going to be is going to have a bigger impact on the young people because they are going to be long, during a longer time on this planet and because they have more health conditions. And when you see this kind of science side, you can see it on the climate litigation topic. Because you can see that, and Ida just presented really well, and you can see that there are 2,000 and even more climate uh, cases bringing into the, into the world in every country, uh, in a national way or in international way. And so you have a lot, a lot of climate litigation cases. But most important, you have a lot of climate cases bringing by young people. And that's interesting because why that? Why, why young people? And that's the point that we have to keep in mind. You may say that young people just can go to court because I feel concerned, I'm stressed about climate crisis, so I can go to court. But that's not easy. As Ida said, they, there is a lot of money and you have to pay your lawyer. Sometimes you can have the help of the state to attack the state itself. In Belgium, you can. In France, sometimes you can. In Europe, in general, you can. But you have to keep in mind that they are standing condition. So you have to be directly impacted by the climate crisis. For example, you have to, to get a, like kind of a, um, a different uh, impact on, um, on you. So it's not enough to say that you are eco-anxious or that you, have, um, you are conscious about the climate crisis. You're really need to demonstrate that the climate crisis got a, a big impact on your personal life. And so we, we may say we, when we analyze the climate litigation in the world, uh, like uh, the Canadian um, case, the um, pl people climate case in the European Union, uh, all the young people were denied access to justice because they don't have a standing. So that's one of the major difficulties for the young people to be able to access to the courts. And that's something that you have to keep in mind before going to court. And so as lawyer, we just develop kind of a tool. Uh, it's to make like a um, ideal profile of young people that can go to court. So you have to, when, when you look at the plaintiff, you have to get people that are directly impacted by fire, by flood, by extreme weather, by all these kind of conditions. And the more you are, the better it is. And when you are in an association, you have different conditions that you need to respect. And you have also to look at the condition of the state. So it's kind of a difficult way. So it's, all, it's always a good idea to ask a lawyer first. But the major advice that I can give is just 
as Ida say, just join your friends and just look who is impacted and how. And just try to get some different um, impacts like fire, flood, uh, temperature, sea, island, uh, different situation to make, to make it like a direct impact. Because it's not because you are impacted that you have an access to court. So that will be my first advice. And then when you look at the climate litigation, as Ida said, and I, as I said, you have a lot of climate litigation by the young people. Because when you get access to court, it's a really good point to be a young people. Why? Because you can use like different arguments. Because you can you can um, invoke, and uh, Samira said it during her presentation, it's all about inter intergenerational equity. Because it's kind of a it's kind of a way to demonstrate that the states discriminate the people of the young people and the and and the older people, and you can even go further because you can demonstrate that there is a discrimination because the people of today the young people of today like us in the meeting and the young people that are not even born but that will be born in the future generation, and a state doesn't have the right to discriminate the people. And so it's a way, having Young as a plaintiff is a way to develop different arguments on the discrimination. And so in Europe, because it's the field that I know the best, you have Article 14 of the European Convention. Um, and uh, for, for the case, um, one of the major cases, you know, the, the court just asked the plaintiff and the states um, to, to just... Uh, explain if there is a discrimination about intergenerational equity. So that means that the European Court of Justice believe that as, as, this day, as this stage, they believe that there is a discrimination between the future generation and us. And so it's really a way to just say that the, the state doesn't do enough to protect young people. And it's a way to achieve a climate uh, transition. And when you go to the climate litigation in the in the south of the world, you also um, they are also fighting for um, the rights of the young um, based on the rights of the nature and the right to get a future um, um, with dignity. And so you you have all different arguments that you can use when you are young people, and that explain why you have a lot of climate litigation. Um, in the world less by young people. But there are risks. If you don't have a standing or if you are not directly impacted by climate change, as I say, by fire, by flood or whatsoever, states can fight against you back and just say that you are making an abusive procedure, for example. And if they just... Um, they can demonstrate that your procedure was abusive, then you have a lot of problems because you are going to be uh, filed with money and, and stuff like that. And it's and so it's really important for any one of you that just want to um, want to fight and want to lead an action and just uh, go to court. Just please, at first, just check your standing and just join all together and try to find different situations to demonstrate that you have standing. And when you get that. You can, if you want, I'm just, I will, I will be happy to help and just give an advice. There is just like uh, no problem, but just please first just check that because it's the major impact. And then it's also important to know if you fight on a national level or an international level, because they are a different uh, instrument that you can use. And when we are young people or children, even children, they can use the the um, Convention for the, the, the Rights of Children, for example. I, I think that Greta Thunberg did it. And so you have different instruments that you can use when you are young people, but the major impact is standing. And so that's kind of the legal advice that I can give is to check your standing. And when you go, when you go that, just go for it because you have a bigger chance to win that any other plaintiff at the moment. So. I hope just it give you a good uh, first point of view about how to just uh, fight against your states and just make them accountable for their actions and protect your future. And if uh, any of you just have question or just uh, need uh, to have some information, I will be more than happy to help. 
Thank you very much.